are listening to the Bat Flip Podcast, a baseball podcast from Belly Up Sports and the Belly Up Podcast Network. Here are your hosts, Damian and Matt. Welcome back, everyone, to the Bat Flip Podcast. My name is Damian. Here is my co-host, Matt, coming to you on May 18th of 2022. Got an uh, interesting episode this week. Got some uh, MLB breaking some viewership records. A uh, couple no-hitters, one official, one not. A uh, couple veteran moves that we need to talk about. And then some other injury news type uh, performances that happened over the week. Then at the end, we'll jump to our players of the week like always. But before we get into all of that, how are you doing, Matt? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, had a pretty good week. Uh, my baseball team hasn't been doing especially well, but that's okay. Um, I uh, we're, you know, we're recording a day late. I actually went to a game last night. Um, it was a, a college game, and uh, so that part of the year is getting – heating up with the college postseason about to go and get underway that's always fun i actually live less than a mile from the where the sec baseball tournament is held which if uh you aren't aware the sec is the best conference in college baseball so it's a lot of fun to get to go get a chance to go to a lot of those games and see a bunch of uh you know those college players before they get drafted and you know become superstars i mean i've been able to go out there and see guys like you know aaron nola dallas keichel played in, in that tournament uh you know all these these top level alex bragman i remember watching him uh, i remember watching mike yastrzemski play there all these guys uh you know getting a, getting a shot to play in, in hoover and uh before going into the obviously into the into the pro ball and, and becoming you know big league stars so um it's always a lot of fun i'm pretty excited about that but uh but yeah, had a pretty good week and uh, ready to talk about a little bit of baseball. Yeah, well, let's go ahead and jump right in. And it's actually a, a something I just saw today, which I thought it was really interesting. Um, and that it was that MLB is breaking the viewership record on its streaming site, MLB.tv, this year. Um, so far, over the first 40 days of the season, 2.8 billion minutes of game action. Um, has been watched in the first 40 days, which is a 9% increase over the same period as last year, um, with nine of the, the most 10 or nine most watched days out of the top 10 in the history of the platform coming this year. Um, and if you look at some of the other stuff, one, one factor of that is also that they're bringing the big inning channel back. Um, and it, it's, got a big jump in itself by a 653% jump in the minutes watched there. Um, adding some pregame post game shows as well. Um, and then as far as their YouTube content they're uh, they're really stepping that game up as well. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, obviously anytime you have a, a ratings increase, that's, that's good news for the sport and everything. Uh, you know, I do wonder a little bit on the MLB.tv ratings, you know, a lot of people cut cords, how much of that is new fans and how much of it is, you know, people who are just cut the cord. And, but but the good news is that, that it does still bode really well for baseball because those people cutting the cord, are they, they don't want to lose their baseball. They want to keep watching. So, um, you know, that 9% increase, that, that's still really good news. Uh, the 53% increase on YouTube is great too because I think that, you know, a lot of times your, your content, you know, that comes out of YouTube helps grow with a younger demographic of fans, people, you know, kids on YouTube, they want, you know, they just watch sports highlights and stuff. When baseball becomes a big part of that, you know, it makes them want to tune in and watch games on a daily basis, which is a really big, really big thing and, and, and really good news. I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, you go around at other sports and I think it's, it's led to a lot of the increase in popularity of, especially of the NBA has been through a lot of the YouTube and, uh, people talking about the NBA on YouTube. And I know that the content that you're talking about with the, you know, just the MLB channel, that's been part of it too. But, um, you know, a lot of it being, you know, Major League Baseball content creators on YouTube has, has helped a lot um, and will continue to help if, if that continues to grow. So definitely, uh, definitely pretty cool, um, pretty cool stuff there. Very good news for baseball. Um, you know, I think that it's encouraging to see there's still a lot of issues with MLB TV. Uh, a lot of blackout issues that are really, um, you know, really, really frustrating for a lot of fans. Um, you know, luckily I, I have my, you know, I have a, a subscription to a local, to, my, to the, you know, to direct TV. So I don't have to deal with the blackout when I watch the Braves, you know, I can watch them on, on the sign into my provider on the apps. But, uh, but for a lot of people who that's their only source of watching baseball, that that's really frustrating to them. But, um, 
but yeah, it's definitely uh definitely a good uh, you know good ratings increase. That's always you know that's never a negative. It's always a positive. So good for the sport and good for baseball of of bringing you know making that platform even though there's still a lot of issues with it, making it better to the point to where you can have a, you know, you have a lot of people interested watching, especially with like, like you mentioned with that beginning uh, channel. Yeah. And I think this is the the thing I was kind of hoping to see this year. Um, you know, we made a big talk about MLB couldn't lose the momentum that they gained off of last season. Um, and I think this just kind of backs up. Like they had a ton of momentum and we're seeing that, so far through these numbers now it could be the the cord cutting base as well um you know that that helps bring these up but i think overall it's just a it's a general good sign for the game um yeah. you know and some of the blackout issues you can work around it if you have a vpn which most people are getting vpns nowadays just for general purposes on of online use so um you know, I, I use a VPN basically on my computer so i can turn around and watch the dodger game on mlb tv anyways um so it, it's pretty simple to use that way. Yeah, I do want to mention one thing about the, um, but uh, the, what baseball's done. I'm really, really, really frustrated with them and their agreement that they made with Peacock, and their agreement they made with Apple Plus TV. Um, I really, really don't like them having national games that take that have exclusive exclusive national games that they take off of the local team's market and put behind a paywall, especially when it's a team that's only going to be played on there one time. Like, you know, if the Braves on Sunday played a 11.30 a.m. local time, which my time is 10.30 a.m. game on Peacock, and it was behind a paywall. So unless I wanted to pay $10 or whatever a month, uh, you know, obviously there's ways you can get around that by, you know, opening up a account, you know, canceling before your free trial's over or whatever. But Still, I mean, that I think that's really frustrating that, you know, they're going to lock games behind paywalls that for, for teams and, that, who have no option to watch it in their local market. Because, I mean, I couldn't care less about any other Peacock uh, stuff. So uh, same goes for Apple TV+. Plus. Right now it's free, but I believe that they're supposed to start charging for that as well. And, um, you know, making those exclusives and taking them, taking that out of, I mean, that's just directly taking it out, out of out of people's, you know, living rooms that's directly taking it off out of people's typical streams like MLB TV. So that, I think that's a really, really poor decision by, by MLB. I figured we, we don't talk about while we're talking about some of the media stuff, but um, definitely, uh, definitely something to look forward to going, going forward. There's a lot of improvements that could be made. And I think that those improvements could really help, you know, grow ratings and grow the sport too. Uh, there's a lot of things that could be done, but definitely very encouraged by some of the ratings bumps and, and just general interest increase. I've had people asking me about baseball that don't typically ask me about baseball this year. So that's always a good sign when that happens. It very much is. Um, and one of the, let's should go ahead and jump on to our next topic. Um, and that's with one of the two, like no hitters in quotation marks, one of them not being official, but the first one is that was Reed Detmers actually happened Tuesday as we were recording this. I think I, uh, I got done, watched the, the ninth inning, I believe. Um, he threw a no hitter against Tampa, uh, only two strikeouts, one walk on 108 pitches, uh, really just a, a real contact based game. Um, that didn't have much, much really to it. Yeah. Reed Detmers is a guy that I think coming into the year, I was a little bit high on him. Um, I felt like he was a guy that hadn't been talked about enough as a breakout candidate for a young pitcher who was, you know, top prospect as of a year ago. Uh, but he's having a, he's having a pretty good year so far. He's not breaking out to the level that I was kind of hoping he would break out to a 415 ERA, a 461 fit. It's not that great. He's not striking guys out, which is a little bit frustrating for a guy who, you know, in the minor league struck a ton of guys out, but um, I definitely really like Reed Detmers, and that no hitter was something special for him. Uh, you know, being able to throw the you know first complete game no hitter of the year. We we did have a combined from the Mets a few weeks ago, but uh, you know he threw a real no hitter, and that was really fun to watch. And, and it kind of goes, you know, it's it, the Angels kind of seem to be rolling right now. I mean, they just keep having things happen with them that are you know like Reed Detmers throwing a no hitter and. You know, that same game was wild. I think uh, Trout homered twice. Uh, Trout, Trout and Otani went back-to-back, I think, was one of the mm-hmm. things that happened in that game. And then um, they had the Rendon hit a home run left-handed uh, off a position player, which is pretty crazy. 
uh, that almost overshadowed people talking about that almost overshadowed the no hitter was the left handed home run for Rendon who hasn't hit le- right left handed as a pro. I'm sure he switch hit at some point in his in his past, but uh, that was pretty crazy too. But um, you know, definitely a, a really good really good thing for for LA uh, the Angels and uh, you know that like I say the Angels are pitching really well. Um, Patrick Sandoval's pitched well. Shohei Otani's pitched really well. Uh, Noah Syndergaard has pitched well for the most part. He had a bad outing this week, but um, you know, even Michael Lorenzen as a 357 ERA, not too bad. And, and Reed Detmers just kind of adds to that. He's been pretty solid. So uh, definitely some, uh, in, you know, that was that's kind of been their downfall for a while. It's been the pitching, and you know, so far this year it's been pretty good. So uh, you know, if you if that continues, the look out for the Angels. Of course, they already have one of the better records in the game, but they've been uh, they've been pretty good on the mound so far, and that's been good for them. Yeah, you mentioned that whole Rendona at bat almost taken away from the no hitter. I think my favorite part of that is when he went up to go bat lefty, he had his shin guard still on his left leg. Yeah, so the shin guard was on his back leg as he was doing it, and then he hits like a one that almost hits it to uh, for a homer, which was pretty wild. But um, you know, you mentioned a lot of people were high on Detmers coming into this year. Uh, he wasn't basically to the level that most people are thinking, but also he's he's still pretty young. He's only twenty two, I believe. Just his second real year getting major league time. So probably more will come. But, I mean, it was cool to see the flashes of what he could be, even if it wasn't a high strikeout, which I think most people expect him to, to get be a higher strikeout guy. Um, but overall, it was it was pretty, pretty good to see. And against an offense in Tampa that usually finds a way to get hits and get on base a lot. Um, and if you're only talking about one walk here, you know, and obviously no hits, like that, that's a pretty well-pitched game against an offense that can be potent at times. Um, so really good to see, but we'll jump over to our next one. And this is a, uh, in quotation marks, no hitter. And that's because it's not technically official, uh, because the reds were in Pittsburgh this weekend through a no hitter started by Hunter green, um, and ended up losing the game because after Hunter green came out, uh, I believe he walked the first one or the second one. Um, anyways, they ended up getting, walking the bases loaded against the pirates, um, there was a ground ball, and Cabrian Hayes beat out the double play, and the Pirates scored their run that way, and it was a one nothing game. The Reds technically threw a no hitter, but didn't pitch in the ninth, so it's not official. And end up losing the game one to nothing. Yeah, I, th- I thought a few thoughts about this. The first thing is it's hard to call a game. I mean, I, it technically, yeah. I mean, well, technically this one wasn't because of the eight innings, but right. I mean, technically, you know, that would be if it would have been a nine inning full complete game, it would have been a no hitter. But, I mean, it's hard to call games where, even though it is a no-hitter, I mean, when you walk five, six, seven guys in a game, I mean, there's tons of games that have four or five runs scored. You're going to have four or five hits and are much better pitched games than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Hunter Green pitched extremely well in this game. He should not have been back out there. He was well over 100 pitches. A guy who's struggled with injuries in the past. It's not like he was throwing a perfect game. He had already had, like, three walks going into that eighth inning he wasn't going to be able to finish the game he was over 100 pitches before the inning um uh, which is i thought that was kind of bad to send him back out there i mean i'll i will crucify anybody who you know who 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 will pull a guy in a perfect game you know i'll be if he's got one walk and there's a legitimate shot he could get it get through it like if he's pitched eight innings or something you know 100 percent. i think he should go back out there but I mean, he's he's finished seven innings. He's got three walks. He's got he's over a hundred pitches. There's no reason to send a guy who's had injury issues back out there. And then of course, um, you know, when you send guys out there and they walk guys, I mean, you could score runs without getting hits. I think it should be known, especially in today's game where, you know, there's there's tons of guys. There's a lot of pitchers that are struggling with command, and you know, walked a bunch of guys, and you know, it happened. I mean. Obviously, it's hard to score more than one or two runs without getting a hit. So, um, you know, you look at the the uh, you know you look at the fact that the Reds didn't score any runs is obviously, you know, they probably would have won with the no hitter. But uh, but anyways, it, it's just kind of you know, I don't know. It, it's just really rough. Um, I think that that has happened before. Um, 
you know, yeah. I think the the Dodgers and the Angels was the last one in like 2008. Was that? I think that was Irvin Irvin Santana through that uh, one. But, I don't know if it was Santana or if it was a, Weaver. I don't know. That might have been a, a legitimate no hitter because it, they. I think they might have pitched the full nine innings, which is, I, I do believe that if even if even if they lose, it's still considered a no hitter in the record books right. as long as you're the as long as you're the home team and you pitched nine innings. Correct, because so, it was it did happen in Anaheim. Yeah, so that so. was so that would have been a no hitter, but uh, but yeah, this this was a uh, yeah that's a that's a rough that's a rough way to you know, lose game, obviously and get allowed no hits and lose. I mean, it's the most reds way to lose a game this year. Like, isn't it like really the, how, for how bad the reds have been this year, this is just like the icing on the cake. Like to even say like, you can lose a game while not even giving up a hit. That's how bad you are this year. Like that's, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, Of course course I don't, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to disagree with that. And the only reason is because, the most Reds way to lose this year is to give up a ton of hits and give up a ton of runs and not get any hits and lose. <laughs> so, you know, that's the Reds way to that's, lose. Just that's get, give, yeah, this, they don't even do anything close to fun. <laughs> so, yeah. But anyways. Uh, so next thing we want to jump to is just a couple little small things. Um, we had mentioned Chris Paddock got injured um, last week and we didn't know the, the severity of it quite yet. Um, it was confirmed, and he actually did have Tommy John surgery today. So he's out through the rest of the season and most likely most of next season. Um, and then another thing that happened was we talked about Robinson Cano getting DFA'd from the Mets. Uh, he has actually ended up signing a one-year deal with the San Diego Padres, um, a one-year MLB deal with the Padres, and is on their active roster now. Yeah, with Robinson Cano, uh, well, first off with Paddock, Paddock was actually pitching pretty well for the Twins. So I know he mentioned it a little bit last week, but it's worth mentioning that that is a big loss for the Twins. And, and that makes that trade look really, really bad on their side because, you know, I thought that it was a good trade for them, bringing in a guy who had some control, who could possibly figure it out as a starting pitcher for one year of a closer. But that closer has looked pretty elite so far that they gave up and, you know, Paddock now sounds like it's probably not going to pitch in 2023. It sounds like 2024 will be the next time he pitches at the big league level. And for a guy who has not even, has not fully figured it out for a season at the big league level, it's hard to imagine him really becoming what you were hoping he would become at this point. So um, there are still some believers in him before this year and he was showing some promise, but man, he's been, he, that's going to be, it's, that's really, that's a really a tough break for him. But, uh, Robinson Cano, obviously he's not very good anymore. He looks cooked at the plate. Um, you know, he's not really capable of playing an infield spot anymore. He's already been worth minus a half minus 0.5 war this year. Um, so that's really tough. Um, you know, he made an error in the Braves series against the Padres that cost them a game, uh, that, didn't help his cause so um i really don't understand fully why san diego went after him but i guess you know they just needed somebody to fill up at bats i don't know maybe he's still a lefty bat off the bench that has some, that has a lot of experience but um you know i think robinson cano will probably be done after this year i, I doubt he ends up anywhere um next year so um definitely not a good not a very good, uh, not a very good start for him in San Diego, and and he was he was atrocious with the Mets, so um, I think he's done. So yeah, it's it's basically just a dart throw by the Padres at this point. Um, I mean, there's probably even the chance that he doesn't even make it through the year. Um, yeah. You know, once they get once they get Tatis back, um, which they're hoping by the end of June um, is when he's able to be back, they'll just have way too many people on the infield. Um, even if they do look at making Tatis an outfielder this year, it's just there's there's no room there. Once you have Cronenworth, Kim, uh, you know, Voight, Hosmer, Machado, like you have too many guys. Um, so I, I think it's just a get me over now. If you if you strike pay dirt with him and he, he shows anything, then maybe you're able to flip him later. But um, it was just shot in the dark type thing. Paddock, it really does suck. Um, I wasn't I, I was one that wasn't as high on him as most other people were. But he was having a pretty good season, um, you know, as far as his standards were and being laid over there, getting a new pitching coach and, and just learning the way they were going about it. Um, so it does suck to see that. And I, I never wish injuries on anybody. 
But let's go ahead and jump on to the next topic we have, and it's another unfortunate side of the record books, if you want to say that. But uh, Nathan Eovaldi yesterday tied in a record with, I believe it was Chase Anderson and Michael Blazik. Um, Anderson being in 2020, Blazik being in 2017, by allowing five homers in one inning. Uh, he ended up going, I think, one and two thirds, 39 pitches, gave up like nine runs, six earned runs, um, no strikeouts, but uh, but five homers in one inning is it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, uh, Nathan Evaldi is a guy that this kind of summarizes him. Um, he and obviously he doesn't always give up a lot of home runs, but he's a guy who he, he is the most attacking pitcher out there. He does not walk people. He throws a lot of strikes. And if you're around the strike zone, you're going to occasionally have a day where maybe your fastball doesn't have the same kind of run on it. Maybe the splitter doesn't have the same movement as it usually does. And you're going to get hit some. And, you know, they facing a really good offense. I mean, the Astros just hit him. I mean, He's not gonna, you know, he's not gonna give up a home run and get scared to throw strikes and walk a bunch of guys. He's just gonna keep throwing strikes, and if you're hitting them, you're hitting them, and that's what happened in this game. And um, I saw somewhere that, uh, you know, he had a, um, he had never, or that that this was like the first time in like 15 years somebody had given up five home runs, or it was something, something someone had given up, you know, started a game with a certain amount of. It pitches or something without getting a strikeout and giving up like five runs or something. I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was, it was pretty remarkable. Or it was, it was five, five home runs in a game without getting a strikeout. And, um, I mean, I've never heard of five home runs in an inning. I mean, that's pretty bad. So, uh, but, uh, you know, it's just kind of Nate, Nate Evaldi, you know, every once in a while is going to have that kind of outing where he just not, maybe not a five home run in one inning outing, but, He's gonna have a couple outings where he gets hit around just because he maybe he's not quiet. Maybe the stuff isn't quite as good as it usually is, and he's just he's never gonna throw balls. He's, he's always gonna throw strikes. So, um, but he'll bounce back. He's a veteran pitcher. His peripherals look really good this year so far. A, a 3.33 xFIP. Obviously, his FIP is really high because of the home runs in that one game. But his home run per fly ball ratio skyrocketed, and that'll that'll even out. That that'll regress back to the mean. But his um, you know, his xFIP was is really good. His expected numbers are good, so uh, th- he'll be fine. Uh, I mean, the Red Sox defense isn't going to help him very much behind him, but um, definitely. Um, Definitely a guy who, you know, every now and then one of these kind of outings happens, even for a really, really good pitcher like Nate Evaldi. So uh, you hate hate it for him, but uh, it's part of the game. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those where, like you mentioned, with, with strike-throwing guys, this tends to happen. Um, the guys who usually limit most of the damage when they're not on are guys who are more type of living on the corners type people and, and movement-based guys where – um, you know, Ivaldi does have some movement, but he just pounds the strike zone. Everything he throws, even the 39 pitches that he had in this game, 31 of them were strikes. Um, so only eight missed pitches, it, you know, for 39 pitches, that's usually a pretty good sign. So he just got hit around, but, you know, it's going to happen. But uh, talking about the, the one bad defensive team to another bad defensive team that's going to make it even worse, uh, we're going to jump to the Philadelphia Phillies and – them getting hit with Bryce Harper having a partial tear in his UCL, um, which for most of you that don't know, UCL is the the ligament that most people have to get Tommy John surgery to repair. Um, so he is shut down from throwing, won't be reexaminated for at least six weeks, then would have some sort of a throwing program after that. Um, I guess the Phillies are, are lucky that the DH did come into play to the NL this year because Bryce Harper will be able to play through it as long as he can manage the pain um, of that and be a DH at that point. But it will, will really hurt the defense because Nick Castellanos is having to become the full-time right fielder now. Um, but on the other side of Harper being the DH, it hasn't really slowed him down. Uh, I witnessed it firsthand with him playing LA this weekend and he only, it was a, Four game series. He didn't play on Sunday, but through the through Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, he was like eight for twelve with three homers, four doubles, like ten or twelve RBIs. It was he, I mean, he's hitting the ball and locked in just as good as ever. But it does suck that he'll he's dealing with this, and you're probably going to lose some games with him having to 
manage that pain and then not be able to to be out there in right field where he's definitely an upgrade over Nick Castellanos. Yeah, this is really unfortunate for the Phillies. Obviously, you know, Harper being able to play is still, uh, as a DH, is good for them. But, um, you know, Harper's already in a, he's just an okay at right fielder. Um, you know, he's not he's not horrible out there, but he's not great. But this is really it. Really hurts to have a one of your. I mean, really, Harper's one of their. He's probably their best defensive outfielder, even though he's not very good out there. And now you've got a, you're you're in a situation where you have both uh, Nick Castellanos and Kyle Schwarber play in the outfield every day who neither one of them should be playing the outfield at all. And then you're going to have that along with an infield that has Alec Bohm most of the time at third base and Reese Hoskins at first base and D.D. Gregorius at shortstop. And it's not like your center field situation is that great with Odubel Herrera being the primary guy there, him or uh, Roman Quinn's not bad in the, you know, as a defender. But still, I, it, it's really that, – that made a poor defensive outfield and, and team even worse and uh you know it sucks for harper uh, especially when you know his arm is really the only quality part of his outfield play his positioning's not that great his uh you know his first step's not great he's not super fast he, he's not slow but um you know he doesn't have a ton of range out there he's just decent out there his arm is really what makes it what's his value in the field is is helps him and his arm you know, obviously is going to be a problem. You know, hopefully it's not a huge problem long term. Hopefully, you know, they can kind of repair it with the rest and rehab and stuff. But, um, you know, it's a big blow for the Phillies to lose. Not necessarily it, it's it could be worse because obviously, you know, it could have been last year and where, you know, you he now he goes on the IL for five weeks, but um, or two months or three months or whatever. But it really does suck to lose your one of your only defenders who's adequate. So uh, definitely hurts the Phillies. Obviously, he's still going to hit though. I mean, he's still Bryce Harper. So when you when he's DHing, he's gonna he's gonna hit the ball well. Uh, he had a great, like you said, he had a great series against the Dodgers this weekend. Uh, the Phillies took three out of four in that series and really should have taken four out of four if if it wasn't for the if it wasn't for the outfield being subpar on. Uh, on Sun in Sunday's game where it they looked like a little bit of a circus out there to me watching it, but um, they probably would have won all four. But this was a um, it's it's tough for the Phillies, but it's not you know going to completely kill them since he's still able to play. Yeah, just mentioning that series, that series was insane at least through Thursday through Saturday. Um, the the two Thursday and Friday nights games were. They, they, they felt like playoff games throughout. It was 12, 10 on Friday night, went into the, went into extras into the 10th inning. The Phillies scored three in the top. Um, the Dodgers had a chance in the bottom of the 10th and I, it was something, some Trey Turner thing. I don't, I don't remember exactly what happened. Um, and then on Friday it was seven, seven going into the ninth. You know, the Dodgers had scored four in the bottom of the eighth to tie it at seven, seven, go to the top of the ninth. The Phillies score two, take the lead bottom of the ninth. The Dodgers have a chance. Don't score anything. I think they even had the bases loaded at one point. Um, it was one out, didn't score anything. Uh, so it was a real playoff type field to the series, which was really fun to watch. Um, and, and two teams that, you know, we could see make a, a deep playoff run, but was a, uh, was pretty enjoyable of a series to watch. But uh, yeah, you know the the loss of Harper. It's gonna be at least in the in the field. You mentioned his arm. That is the his main his main thing out there. And it, you know, watching them play, it wasn't as awful as I expected it to be. I think the, if if they positioned better, it would be a lot easier. Like they had, they were playing this weekend. And they had Castellanos kind of swung over towards the gap against Bellinger, who has is pulling the ball more than ever right now. And then he hits like a triple down the line because they haven't played over towards the gap where you could just prevent that. And he probably gets double if you just play him normal. Um, so the positioning needs to get better if they want to help the the defensive side of the ball there, especially in the outfield, um, you know, with the loss of Harper, because Harper probably keeps that to a double anyways with his arm. Um, so you, you just got to work on that. But uh, that's pretty much what we have for the main part of the show. 
Um, so if we're going to jump over to our players of the week, and who do you have for your offensive player this week? So my offensive player this week is uh, is actually a guy who honestly probably could have been a few times already, but I don't think we've picked him yet. Um, but he's definitely one of the front runners for all the awards right now, and that would be Aaron Judge. Um, Aaron Judge has been really good this year. This was probably his best week yet. Hit 435 this week with a 500 on base and a 1,000 slugging percentage. Uh, 319 WRC plus, um, you know, that's in six games. He had four home runs, which led the majors this week or tied for the lead with Jordan Alvarez. Uh, you know, he always plays great defense in the outfield. Uh, he just had a phenomenal week. Um, you know, his, his plate discipline numbers were really good. Um, you know, which has kind of been a key for him this year and last year is that, you know, his strikeouts have been down over the last couple of years from what they were, they were at for, you know, his first two or three years when he was, when he really broke out, uh, Aaron judge has looked extremely good this year. Um, he looks like a guy who is determined after turning down that contract offer from the Yankees to, uh, you know, to, to prove himself right. And, uh, you know, he's, this is a guy that he could be in that MVP conversation all the way through the end of the season. Um, I mean, he he's definitely he's definitely showing something so far this year at the plate it's been impressive to watch so far yeah he's been pretty locked in um so far to start this year uh i think this is probably the best we've ever seen aaron judge i mean i know he's had the couple seasons where he hit or the one season where he hit like over 50 homers or close to it um but i think this is probably the best judge we've seen and and that's the scary thought um if, if he keeps doing what he's doing right now but, uh, you know, for my hitter this week, I ended up going with a guy by the name of Brendan Donovan from the St. Louis Cardinals. He's an infielder. Um, we had mentioned a little bit last week we didn't know where they were going to go with optioning Paul DeYoung and um, with Edmundo Sosa not getting as much run or, or just coming back off the injured list. Um, and Brendan Donovan was a guy that was kind of helped filling in that gap. And in seven games this week, he hit 467, a 667 on base, and a 733 slugging percentage. Didn't have any homers, but those came from mostly doubles. Um, six runs, three RBIs, a stolen base. The thing that really jumped out to me is just this week alone had a 37.5% walk rate. Uh, so just an, an incredible eye. And uh, I, I knew I, I, I know last week I had said, I didn't know where they were really going to go. Well, Brendan Donovan just showed me where they were kind of going to go this yeah. week. Yeah, he um, he was very good. He, he had a, obviously that's a really really solid week. Um, you mentioned Edmundo Sosa. Edmundo Sosa was played tonight. Got looked like he might have gotten hurt again, so he uh, slid into second. I don't know if he stayed in the game, but he had to walk off with a trainer after he was thrown out at second. So I don't know if he stayed in the game. But hey, um, I I just remembered. Also speaking on the Cardinals, I don't know how I didn't remember this. Albert Pujols pitched this week. And he stole a base today. I think he stole, yeah, he stole a base, but he pitched. He's, so, he's Shohei. He's Shohei Otani. But his yeah. first uh, his first pitching appearance in 22 years or something like that, um, it was pretty funny watching his expressions to giving up home runs and then him yeah. saying, so this is what it felt like all these years of me terrorizing people for 22 seasons, giving up homers. Yeah, uh, and, and another thing with, with him too is that it should have been a scoreless outing but the second baseman that was in the game, I, I don't think it was I – don't, I don't remember who the second baseman was at that time. There were so many players getting subbed in and out for him, uh, botched a double play ball. That would have been a – that would have mm -hmm. ended the inning. So, um, you know, ended the game. But then he gave up some runs. But it was still a lot of fun. Uh, I was watching that on – and that was also the Sunday night baseball game. So yeah. it had a national audience. And that was a really boring game because the Cardinals just absolutely rocked Carlos Rodon in the first couple innings, which was sh shocking. But uh, then, of course, at the end, they had, um, you know, they had uh, Albert Pujols uh, pitching was, was definitely fun to watch. But but, yeah, um, that was one of the more entertaining moments, things we've seen this year, I think. But uh, yeah, yeah, I just I when I. When I saw the Cardinals right now, I don't know why it just popped into my head. Yeah. And I'm like, how did I, I forget that moment? Yeah, I can't believe we didn't talk about uh, that already. So going from uh, from one Hall of Fame pitcher now to another Hall of Fame pitcher. Um, that was a really bad segue, actually. Not a Hall of Fame pitcher. Um, oh, he is. He's well. A pit, he's a pitcher. 
technically because he pitched and he's going to probably be in the hall of fame so yeah i guess technically so who is your pitcher this week well it's not a hall of famer but he, he's also but a that, rookie that, and that's what i was saying my bad segue there yeah he's he, he could be a hall of famer because he's a rookie and he looks pretty dang be. good but uh shane mcclanahan was my guy this week um uh, 14 innings pitch that's two starts he only gave up one run in two starts um he he looks really good. He's looked good all season. 11.5 strikeouts per nine this week. Uh, 0.64 walks per nine. Not walking a lot of guys. He gave up one home run, solo shot. Um, but this guy looks the, like the real deal right now. Uh, eight starts this year so far. Um, a 2.33 ERA. His peripherals back that up. In fact, he has a 1.85 xFIP, which is insanely good. Um, Basically, meaning that he, you know, the projection, the XFIP expected stats believe that he has been very unlucky to have a 2.33 ERA. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he gets the ball on the ground at a 56% rate, and that goes along with, you know, extremely high strikeouts, extremely low walks so far. Um, I don't, I, you know, I, I would expect him to walk a few more guys than he is right now, and I expect him to not strike out quite as many as he is right now. But man, this guy's good. Uh, his velocity is up, which is kind of hard to believe for a guy that was averaging 97 or 96.7 last year on his fastball velocity. Well, now it's 97.4. I mean, he's just preposterous. I mean, he could he has a chance to be. He, nobody's talking about this guy, but man, he looks like he looks to me like a potential superstar. Um, and you know, you add him and one of the best young pitchers in the game to, to Wander Franco, who's prob one of the best young position players in the game and man the Rays just keep figuring out how to get value out of these guys and get these prospects up and I mean this is just it's crazy what they do but uh definitely Shane McClanahan is looking good right now and he had a great week so uh I picked him yeah well it really stands out from watching some of McClanahan's game it's obviously the velocity but it's the movement he has on some of his pitches. Like, I don't know if it's a, a straight two seam or if it's a sinker he throws, but the break that that has breaking into lefties and away from righties is disgusting. And then to, to pair that up with his, it's a slider or a slurve or whatever that pitch is either. Like to, to have those two that break so far the opposite way, but come out of the same tunnel. Um, that, that's disgusting, especially with his velocity and being from a left-handed side. Um, so he he has been pretty fun to watch, and I've been I've really enjoyed seeing him take that little step forward this year. After he, he got some, you know, got in there last year was pretty good, um, but taking that that next step forward this year has been pretty fun to watch. Yeah, he and you you asked you mentioned the fastball. The fastball is actually it's it's technically uh according to the you know the the uh, metrics the pitch info stuff it, it's actually a four seamer that he throws. It's just got a lot of movement there's, on it. So there's no um, shot. Yeah, it's it's so it's showing that he throws four seamer, four seamer. It, one of the things that that this year is change up percentage is gone. He's 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 throwing change up eleven percent higher of the time that he did last year. Last year he threw eight percent change ups. This year nineteen percent. So uh, he's also throwing a lot more curveballs and relying a lot less on the slider. That might be one of those kind of slurve curveball type things that you, you mentioned. But yeah. but yeah, he was uh he actually was throwing um his change ups a split finger, but. He's actually not throwing. He's actually throwing four seamers, uh, according to you know the Statcast stuff. So um, you know sometimes it can be a little bit. You know he throws a little bit. It's not sidearm, but he's you know kind of low three quarters. Sometimes that backspin on the ball to get that fastball does make it run kind of like a two seamer if you're throwing like three quarters. So maybe that helps that. But um, but man, is Shane McClanahan looks good. That is pretty interesting. Um, I didn't. I didn't. I thought he threw a two seamer, but it could be like Kenley. Um, Kenley Jansen throws a, a cutter with a four seam grip as well. So um, just the way it comes off his hand, so it could be something like that. But I could have swore it was like a two seam or hard sink or something. Um, but that's well, it might, and, and it might be. It just the way the spin is they on track it. it. They yeah. track it as a four seamer because of the spin yeah. on it. So that's true. Uh, so my pitcher this week is a guy by the name of Zach. Uh, Lug or Laug, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm butchering that, um, but he's from the Oakland A's. He was actually a part of the Matt Chapman trade from Toronto to Oakland this year. Um, he had two starts this week. One in, against Minnesota was four and a third innings, gave up two runs, didn't, 
two strikeouts, two walks, um, but had seven shutout innings against Detroit with six strikeouts as well, no walks, um, five hits in each game. Um, he just had an overall really good week. Uh, and the really reason I really wanted to mention him is because they actually ended up optioning him today as well. So he had really good week. And then, you know, part of that trade package from the Chapman trade then got optioned um, because I think they're, they're Colt Urban supposed to be back within the next couple of days. Um, but Zach, uh, Zach Loger or Lauger, who, however you say it, that's my pitcher this week. Yeah, that, and that's a pretty nice story for him, uh, being able to pitch 17 innings at the big league level and, uh, you know, getting a kind of a cu- cup of coffee in the big leagues. And uh, he was actually really struggling at AAA before he came up and had a couple of really nice outings. So that, that's solid. Um, you know, the A's have had some success with this type of guy. He doesn't throw very hard, but, um, you know, he, uh, he's he got a really good change up. And, um, you know, they, they've had some success with these types of guys. His command is pretty decent. For the most part, uh, hadn't been at AAA, but in the past, it's been really good. In fact, last year in Toronto, you know, under two walks per nine, you know, across two levels, which was really solid. But, um, you know, that's that's nice. And and to be honest, uh, the Matt Chapman trade's looking pretty bad for the Blue Jays right now because Matt Chapman has been defensively has been solid, but offensively has been pretty rough. You know, a 183 average is is pretty bad. A lot of that is. Um, a lot of that has been uh, Babbitt luck, though, as he's a 205 Babbitt. But um, you know, looking at uh, looking at some of the, uh, you know, his strikeouts pile up on Matt Chapman pretty quick, and you know he needs to be hit a lot more, a lot more power, and uh, you know, because he also kind of pops it up a lot. Doesn't have a great batted ball profile to have a to hit for a high average. So he's he's hit for a very low average. It's bringing his whole line down and. Uh, you know, maybe he'll figure it out. Um, long, lot, you know, small sample size, still a lot of season left to go, but definitely a really solid, um, you know, a solid start for a guy that, you know, the A's traded one of their top, you know, players from the past three or four years. And, um, you know, they're getting some early returns that are encouraging from one of them, you know, lefty. So, um, you know, I think they're kind of sending a guy down that's real similar to the guy they're bringing up. So, <laughs> Yeah, uh, just looking at the mentioning the whole Matt Chapman thing, the he is hitting the ball pretty hard this year. He's yeah. in the top six percent in hard hit rate and top eleven percent in average exit velocity. So I I do think there will be some uh, you know some pretty good you know progression back towards his way. Um, but he has looked really bad so far to start this year. But uh, getting some early returns like the you know the A is trying to just figure out you know what they got right now and in that so. But uh, that's we'll wrap it up for the players of the week segment. Any final thoughts you want to wrap up on the episode? Um, not not all that much. Um, you know we've had a you know well over a month into the season now, and you know you're starting to see some uh some guys uh, definitely some some of that small sample size starting to go away a little bit. Um, you know there's some guys that are having breakout performances that you're starting to see really kind of cement themselves as breakout players. Guys like Taylor Ward. Uh, you know, Ty France, if, you know, he, he kind of broke out last year, but being at the level he's at this year has been really good. Um, it's been really, really, really fun to watch the resurgence of Mike Trout after some injury issues the last couple of years. Hopefully he stays healthy the rest of the year. Uh, but, man, I, we were just talking about him earlier before the show, and he's hit a home run again tonight. He's just been on a tear so far, uh, which is really fun to see for a guy who, you know, like I say, has dealt with the injury issues the last couple of years, and feel robbed you know of him you know being healthy throughout his prime but um you know we'll see what happens uh you know we've got a you know about a month before you know we really start to get into all-star talk and uh you know i think teams really need to kind of make a move now if you had a bad start i think you really need to get on that win streak kind of get back to being a contender right now if you've had a really really good start you know this is not the time to let up i think um you know, I think you're about to separate who's kind of the real contenders and who's kind of the teams that aren't that are kind of I won't say fake, but aren't quite as good as they they've looked. Like, are the Mets and the Angels really as good as they played so far? Are they going to continue to play the way that they played so far? Are teams like the, you know, like like the Braves or uh, you know maybe like the uh, maybe the White Sox teams like that who are expected to be you know division 
division favorites and, and World Series contenders, are they going to continue to play poorly? Uh, that's going to be, I think that's something you'll probably see in the next few weeks if those teams are able to bring it bring it on or, or, or not. And uh, it's an important time because, I mean, like I said, you cannot get too far behind right now in, in May because if you get down, you know, seven, eight, nine games, it's hard to make up. Um, you know, everyone's situation is different, but um, it's hard to make up a, a big deficit. And, you know, you build that cushion and you can afford to have some things happen. You know, like if the Mets lose another pitcher, like say Scherzer has to miss a few starts at some point. He's, you know, he's up there in years. You know, if they build a big enough lead, that's not going to matter. You know, say Trout, you know, he's had snagging injuries in the past. Say Trout needs to miss a week or two. You know, if the Angels are able to build a pretty big lead, you know, that that won't matter quite as much. So, I mean, it'll matter, but it won't be the end of the world for them if they have a big lead. So, definitely um, definitely looking forward to uh, seeing what the next few weeks brings and uh, exciting time. So. Yeah, what I really wanted to wrap up the show on is something that I've been noticing um about the last week or so and i think that it's the it's starting to see the resurgence of the offense um and i don't know if it's because it's getting warmer um so balls are carrying a little bit more um if we're getting more some maybe more juiced balls back into the league um or also i know i've seen like cedric mullins said it um T- trey turner uh, chris taylor were talking about it and another who's the other guy i saw talking about it um they're mentioning more about trying to focus instead of, of the launch angle on trying to get backspin on the ball um, to help the ball carry farther now. Um, and some of those you're seeing the ones that people expected to go to the warning track or, you know, you expected to be homers that were going to the warning track or maybe carrying it out now because you're seeing the backspin to it. Um, so it, it's going to be interesting to see how that continues to progress. Um, you know, we said that it was the pitchers having the, you know, the non-juiced balls as much kind of early on in the year, you weren't seeing the power um, surges as much. But now I think over the last week, you've seen, you know, multiple games that have had high scoring games. I mentioned two of the Dodgers ones, the Cardinals scored a bunch. Um, I believe there was a game today where a team scored 14. So you're starting to see that offensive surge. Is that because of the ball? Um, are we getting back to the other ball from last year, the past couple of years? Are hitters trying to figure out or starting to figure out because of the spin and the way to hit it? Or is that just natural because of the it's getting hotter and the ball usually carries um, in the heat more than anything? So I think that's one interesting part to watch, especially over these next few weeks as we start getting into the, you know, the early summer months, late spring, early summer about how that progresses and, and where we see that going forward. Yeah, and that's that's really interesting. Just to kind of piggyback on that, I think it's probably a combination of all that. But I will say that I think a lot of the uppercut swings you've started to see, even more and more so uppercuts. Uh, you know, if you hit up on the ball like that, it's going to put less top or less backspin. It doesn't necessarily put top spin, but it puts less backspin on the ball if you if you're swinging up onto the ball. Um, and I don't know if that has a lot to do with it or not, but some of these guys really focusing so hard on launch angle, they might be hurting themselves by putting up a stat cast that says, oh, he hit it at 105 miles per hour at a 30 degree launch angle. It should be a home run. But, you know, you're swinging up on the ball, hitting the, you know, hitting it up on it and put the top spin on it. That's going to cause it to not carry as far. And it seems to me like so far the problem hadn't been necessarily that the ball's not juiced or juiced differently or whatever. It's the fact that the seams are different. The ball doesn't carry. It's a humidor thing. It seems to be what's what's kind of changed things to me. And, uh, you know, if the ball ca- the, the ball's going to carry a lot more if you put backspin on it. So uh, definitely interesting. And, and you know, I, I had not seen that there were a lot of players talking about the backspin thing. Uh, but that, that's a, that's that's very really interesting to think about. Maybe maybe we'll see more of that going forward. So, yeah, I would I wouldn't be surprised if that's the new emphasis thing we see is trying to find more backspin in it. Um, because, like I said, I saw Mullins talk about it, and then specifically multiple times this week, Chris Taylor and Trey Turner talked about it um, as well. So, it was uh, it was pretty interesting and, and definitely something to watch moving forward. But. That's going to wrap up this episode of the Bat Flip Podcast. Thanks you all for tuning in, and we'll catch you guys next week. Thanks, everybody.